the nuclear option send ASIC officials to jail. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. Hello, John. We're back again. We are back again, sir. And uh, can I say, Martin, I find it amazing that you'd be talking to me today, given that ASIC officials have been running around Melbourne for the last few months calling me a nutcase. We, we have a few things to cover in this show, but uh, one of the things that I've been able to discover in the last seven days uh, given that I had to go to Melbourne uh, for something quite urgent. I got to speak to a, a journalist who has been writing about uh, the ASIC inquiry over the last few months. And uh, we got to meet for 30 minutes. And uh, in the course of that meeting, uh, where I was able to show a number of uh, sens sensitive documents and actually explain to the journalist what's really going on behind the scenes. The journalist said that uh, he had been approached by the ASIC committee team only in the last few months in which they wanted to uh, uh, provide a counter narrative about John Adams, who is a certified nutcase. So, uh, so the fact that you've uh, invited me back on the show, Martin, is who knows? Maybe you have sympathy for those who are uh, who have mental illness. I don't know. <laughs> well, some would say that uh, I sail close to the wind, but uh, I think these issues are really substantive and significant. And uh, I have to say that Essex, um uh, attempts to effectively dilute the power of your message to me speaks more about the fact that they're concerned about what you're saying more than anything else. Yes, well, I mean, the, the, the thing about this show, Martin, is and whether ASIC will watch this show or not is I don't think ASIC fully understands the seriousness of, of where we're up to in this entire uh, journey because uh, the title of the show is Send ASIC Officials to Jail and we are going to get deep into the powers of Parliament. And one thing I'll say, Martin, is, is that Parliament has the power to send people to jail. Now, I first discovered some of these uh, details about uh, 10 years ago and over the last 10 years uh, since I've uh, since I worked in Parliament, and I say most uh, parliamentarians have no idea about uh, Parliament's powers. I would I would akin this situation, Martin, to um, the uh, a politician in reality holding a a fifty caliber machine gun, and yet they think they're only holding a handgun. Uh, the reality, Martin, is is that most politicians have enormous power, and the Parliament has enormous powers, and yet most politicians and and the general public at large. And perhaps even ASIC has no idea how extensive these uh, powers are. And that's what we're going to get into in terms of today's discussion. So, Martin, before we get into what happened this week, so beyond uh, me learning from the mainstream media that uh, ASIC has called me a nutcase uh, behind my back um, as a way to discredit uh, some of my analysis and some of my commentary, there was a uh, very heated confrontation between the Senate Economic References Committee and the Inquiry Chair, Senator Bragg, and in terms of ASIC. So so we're going to get into that and what are the implications of that. But I thought, Martin, obviously last show was a very big show. A lot of people had a very strong reaction to that show when we showed the bombshell email from the morning of the 27th of October. And then obviously, what are the implications of that? So if we can just bring up slide one, just so we could remind our viewers, Martin, is if we look at the second quote from Senator Bragg's media release of the 20th of June, Senator Bragg has said that he is going to refer ASIC to the Privileges Committee. Now, he made that promise before the bombshell of last show. And the one thing I can reveal to the audience, Martin, is I've now formally written uh, to the inquiry with the uh, longer email. So it is now um, within the possession of the entire committee and the committee can obviously examine that whole situation. But obviously we had a promise from Senator Bragg that ASIC would be referred to the Privileges Committee uh, before the bombshell. Now we have the bombshell. Now the other thing I can reveal, Martin, is, is that, and we'll get into this uh, slightly more as we go through this uh, episode, is that in order for a referral to go to the Privileges Committee, there needs to be a vote on the floor of the Senate. Now, basically, there's 76 senators. You need about, you need 39 to carry the majority. Senator Bragg has effectively two pathways to achieving 39 votes. It's either the coalition voting with the Greens. And one thing we should say is that on the 27th of October last year, to establish the inquiry, 
the Greens voted with the coalition to establish the inquiry, so that's not uh, an impossible situation. But uh, the other uh, interesting development, Martin, is, is that given that Senator Lydia Thorpe has quit the Greens, the uh, mathematics or the arithmetic of the Senate have now changed. So the other pathway to, for this referral to the Privileges Committee to occur is, is that if the coalition and the entire crossbench, which includes One Nation, the United Australia Party, uh, Jackie Lambie's party, and the three independents, Senator Pocock, Senator Thorpe, and Senator Van, if they all vote as one block, that's 39 votes, and you can get a referral to the Privileges Committee. So Senator Bragg, if he is to be true to his public commitment, he has two pathways to get the majority, and we'll obviously have to see what happens in terms of the next couple of weeks. So, uh, but but uh, but once you go to the privileges committee, I mean that is a very serious step, and there are some very serious consequences that can, can flow from that, including imprisonment, and that's something we're going to get into slightly as we get into this week's controversy as well. Yeah, and I have to say I'm not quite clear in my own mind as to why it is that ASIC seems to be burning so much of its um, political credibility, uh, you know, around this. It, there's something that just doesn't gel. Well, the only thing I can say, Martin, is, is that you're scratching your head. I'm scratching my head. The only thing I can assume, Martin, is, is that if I'm a nutcase, given that you're my co-conspirator in some of these programs, maybe ASIC thinks you're a nutcase as well. <laughs> it's spreading. Maybe it's catching. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, we're looking at this objectively, right? You've got, obviously, all the freedom of information requests that have uh, brought information out. You've got Senator Bragg definitely on the case. And uh, what he says in, um, you know, in, in various uh, spheres seems to be quite consistent. He's not going to let this rest. So this issue is going to bubble up into something pretty profound. Well, I think you and I would hope that to be the case. So we'll obviously have to wait and see. But now, Martin, just so we can set the context of what happened this week was so on so we're recording on sunday the 23rd of july so on tuesday on the 18th uh, asic was required to hand over a whole host of records to the inquiry related to closed cases so there's a number of cases where asic did investigate and decided to take no action resulting from those investigations the inquiry wants to see the raw files of those investigations because they want to understand how these investigations uh, occurred and they want to make some judgments as to the quality of the investigations. Uh, ASIC has basically said that there's no way on earth are they going to hand over those files and there's been obviously a very heated back and forth. So there was an order of the Senate to hand over the files, which is a legal order, and the order had to be provided by Tuesday at 12 o'clock. And ASIC did not hand over any files, so they defied the orders of the Senate. Now, we're going to get into the implications of that in a second, but just to prove to the audience about the utter hypocrisy of ASIC, Martin, if we can bring up slide two. Now, I can't tell you how I got this letter, but on Thursday, so we're, tonight's the 23rd of July, a Sunday night, Thursday, uh, Thursday during the day on the 20th of July, someone in Australia received a letter from ASIC. Now, I'm going to just quote one paragraph from the letter because I think this is very critical. So if I can quote from the slide, mine, it says, quote, details of the documents required to be produced are set out in the notice. An additional note is enclosed with the notice that refers to some of the offence and penalty provisions related to non-compliance with, with the notice. Under the ASIC Act, there is a penalty of up to $9,390 or three months imprisonment or both for failing without reasonable excuse to comply with this notice. Martin, this letter, which was sent to an accountant, basically said, we require certain records related to an ASIC investigation and you must comply with the notice. And if you don't, we are threatening you with jail. Now, the key thing you and the audience to understand, Martin, is how is it that ASIC can threaten people in the private sector with jail. Where does that power come from? It comes from parliament. So the so this notice says the ASIC Act. Well, who passed the ASIC Act? Who enacted the ASIC Act? The Senate. So parliament under our constitution basically has the power to give different government agencies legal authority 
to threaten people with jail if they don't comply with orders of the government. And that's what ASIC just did a few days ago. So you have a situation where ASIC says to an accountant, if you don't give me the raw files of what I require and you don't have a reasonable excuse, we can lock you up. And yet in the same week that ASIC did this to an accountant, ASIC basically is saying to the same entity that gave ASIC its power to threaten the private sector, ASIC is saying to the same entity, the Australian Senate, we are not going to give you our raw files. And and I think that's just a hypocrisy in the sense that ASIC expects corporations and private individuals to comply with its notices and to hand over records under the threat of in- imprisonment. And yet when, when the Senate, the same body that gives ASIC its power, says to ASIC, we provide oversight of you, we're conducting an investigation and inquiry into your conduct, hand over the raw files, ASIC says, we're not going to comply with the uh, with the orders of the Senate. If, if that's not hypocrisy, I don't know what is. Well, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Uh, you know, the um, uh, Senate is saying do X and ASIC is saying, we're not going to do X. <laughs> <laughs> so something has got to give somewhere. Yes, so the Senate says do X, ASIC says no, and then at the same time ASIC goes to a private accountant in Australia says you you are going to basically do the, do the same thing that the Senate has asked us, and if you don't do it, we're going to threaten you with jail. Now, Martin, if we go on to slide three, so this whole situation of ASIC not providing any documentation to the Senate in compliant with the Senate order. Senator Bragg has referred to, to this situation as contempt of Parliament or contempt of the Senate. And, and now, the interesting thing is, um, before this situation blew up on Tuesday, ASIC attempted to come up with a compromise position. So ASIC's position is, we're not going to hand you the raw files that you've asked for uh, what they said was, and, and and if you look at the bold uh, writing on the slide, it says um, uh, that the committee prov- you know, uh, wanted to do, quote, including through written submissions with non-confidential information and providing members of the committee with more detail in relation to those matters in an in-camera briefing. So ASIC's compromise position is, well, we won't give you the raw files or our investigative notes or um, other evidence that we collected during the investigation, but we're going to write you a summary. We're going to write you a submission, and we're going to be able to speak to our summary during a, a private confidential hearing. So now, Senator Bragg's response was basically he rejected that offer. He said, the Senate says, give us the raw documents, and we will not compromise anything less than the raw documents, and that's why we had the situation of effectively non-compliance by ASIC, and we have now Senator Bragg in the media saying that ASIC has is, is now guilty of contempt of Parliament. Yeah, and uh, I think he also said, John, that um, you know if ASIC didn't comply, then well, all options are on the table, which <laughs> is a bit of a warning, it seems to me. Yes. Now, great, great segue, Martin. So, if we go on to the next slide, the following day on the nineteenth of July, Senator Bragg issued a statement, and basically he said that ASIC has not complied with the unanimous order of the Senate for the production of documents. ASIC has not met our expectations. As representatives, we we cannot do our jobs if, if the agencies for which we conduct oversight are permitted to treat Parliament with contempt. We will now consider any and all options to continue our work. And and, and, and this is the critical point, Martin, that, that I really want to focus in terms of this episode. And if ASIC's listening, they better understand this particular last sentence by Senator Bragg. So any and all options. I don't think uh, the general public actually understands what, what, how profound that potentially could mean because it, it could actually mean imprisonment of ASIC officials in terms of contempt. So when Senator Bragg says any and all options, that includes a, a whole host of options that parliament has and people should be treating this threat by Senator Bragg extremely seriously because it could escalate into a very ugly situation in Parliament that, that perhaps some at ASIC and some in the general public may not uh, fully comprehend as to where this may ultimately lead to. Yeah, and there is a sort of a political process, right, which effectively the Senate now goes through to um, prosecute this uh, request and uh, <laughs> with that with that 
pretty strong threat, threat actually of uh, you know we will do anything it takes to get the answer that we want so um and, and john the point is uh, and you made the point earlier you know parliament is a very powerful animal and it has lots of legal powers and legal force to prosecute what it wants it is now we're gonna we'll get into those powers in a second martin but um now i just want to go on to the next slide martin so when someone says when so, when a parliamentarian says that someone is in contempt of parliament now contempt is actually defined by various conventions pieces of legislation uh, there's a lot of guidance on the parliament's website about this whole subject so now the critical thing people need to understand martin is, is that a contempt of parliament is breaches of the following provisions so the breaches is the act of then it says attempts or conspiracies to do the prohibited acts now there's a whole list of potential contempts but i've highlighted two so the first one is a person shall not improperly interfere with the free exercise by the senate or a committee of its authority or with the free performance by a senator of the senator's duties as a senator and that and that's the first one on the list and number eight is a person shall not without reasonable excuse disobey a lawful order of the senate or of a committee now martin in relation to the point one so now again the contempt is not actually doing it it's the conspiracy of trying to do it and so what we showed in the last show is there was a conspiracy at ASIC to improperly interfere in the senate's work so in my view we already have us a guilty of point one of, of the first contempt charge by conspiring to interfere in the senate so now, did they actually succeed? No, they didn't. Senator Bragg's motion was passed 43 to 20. The inquiry was established. The terms of reference were were not changed, but we know there was a conspiracy. And the, and the act of the conspiracy is a contempt of parliament according to parliament's own website. So that's one. Now, uh, in, in relation to what happened this week is ASIC not complying with a lawful order of the Senate. Now, that's not a conspiracy. They actually did disobey the Senate and that's why they are guilty of a potential second contempt charge. So people need to be clear about this. It's, did you do it or did you conspire to do it? Well, on on two fronts, ASIC is guilty of both. Yeah, and again, it's pretty pretty clear cut, isn't it? When you when you look at those sentences and then consider what a, we've uh, seen ASIC do in recent times, on both fronts, um, well, they've crossed the line, haven't they? Here's the thing, so the ultimate arbiter as to whether ASIC did or did not cross the line is, is the actual Australian Senate itself. So when a senator thinks that uh, an, an individual or a corporation or a government agency or part of the executive, if they have crossed the line, the proper course of action is to, to make this referral to the Privileges Committee. Now, we, we just referred to, uh, early in the conversation about there are two pathways to getting to 39 votes if Senator Bragg goes forward with his threat to make a referral now when it gets to the uh privileges committee so if we go on to slide six martin again this comes from the parliament's website it says uh, quote the committee's main function is to investigate conduct which is uh, apprehended to obstruct the work of the senate the committee does so only when it receives a reference from the senate this may involve allegations of interference with the functions of the senate or its committees or with senators undertaking their duties the committee undertakes this work in accordance with the senate's privilege resolutions so now uh, the, the key thing about this slide martin is it must be referral from the senate so f if for whatever reason senator bragg can't get 39 votes on the senate well even though we think based on the parliament's own um, language asic is guilty of two contempts of uh, of the senate uh th th this issue will die politically if we can't get to 39 votes so, so so the first thing is it's got to go to the privileges committee and then when it goes to the privileges committee that committee will then conduct a independent investigation of the allegations of contempt and then they'll then they'll come to a, a view as to is the individual the corporation the agency if it's ASIC is ASIC guilty or not guilty now if ASIC is deemed to be guilty what happens then now here's the interesting thing so martin let's go on to slide seven so uh, there's a section of the parliament house website that calls the uh, which refers to the penal jurisdiction of the house 
and it says, quote, the means by which the Houses may enforce the observance of their privileges and immunities and punish people found guilty of contempt include uh, commitment to prison, imposition of a fine, public re reprimand or admonishment, exclusion from the precincts, requirement of an apology publicly if appropriate. And obviously the first point, Martin, is commitment to prison. So, Martin, what, what most Australians don't understand is the when the evolution of the monarchy was developing in, in, in terms of English history, when the first parliament was formed around the 1500s, uh, the parliament had a dual function of both making the laws, but it also sat as a court and it sat in judgment of the king in, in terms of various uh, people who had various disputes. So for the last 500 years, Martin, is, is that parliament, that function of uh, being able to sit as a court, that hasn't been lost. And so uh, it just so happened 10 years ago, Martin, when I was working for Senator Sinodinus, this issue of the, the the judicial functions of of the Senate. There was a particular senator who was interested in in actually looking into this issue, and I spent uh, quite a few days and quite a few nights reading about English history and and about this whole so, so, in terms of this whole subject. So what most people don't understand is the Senate actually can sit as a court, it can sentence people to jail, and it can sentence people to jail if they are found. In contempt of the rules of the Senate or the orders of the Senate, or if they attempt to try to manipulate the the free exercise of the Senate or the senator's duties. Yes, right. So that whole concept of, of the Senate being a court with powers to actually impose penalties, well, I, I'm guessing that almost nobody actually would understand that that's what they can do. I wonder whether the senators do. Well, the, the, the interesting thing, Martin, is that I have raised this subject of the Senate using its powers to put people in jail. And even with some senators, I've had some very blank stares. But even in terms of members of the House of Representatives, a lot of people in, in the system don't fully understand the history of England, the, 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 the original function of Parliament, and how some of those functions have continued on in terms of the last 500 years. Now, the interesting thing is, Martin, is that the ability to impose a jail sentence by parliament or a fine is actually defined in the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987. So, and why don't we go on to slide eight, Martin? So prior to 1987, this whole concept was quite fuzzy and vague. So parliament decided to actually put some structure around this so that people can be clear as to what these powers are and how these powers are to be used by parliament. Now, section four of the act Basically, I mean, this is the section that, that actually has a definition in terms of the offence that has to be committed against the parliament uh, or against each of the chambers, the House or the Senate, in order for this piece of legislation to be enacted. So it says, quote, uh, conduct, including the use of words, does not constitute an offence against the House unless it amounts or is intended or likely to amount to an improper interference with a free exercise by House or committee of its authority or functions or with a free performance by a member of the member's duties as a member. So, so, so Martin, um, that, that basically means is, if we're going to boil this down, is that the House or the Senate has the ultimate authority to basically fulfil its functions under the Constitution, and anyone who gets in the way of Parliament can be guilty under this piece of legislation. And getting in the way is not only interfering in the Senate's work, it's actually not complying with the Senate order. So when the Senate says we need raw documents from ASIC in order to actually complete the inquiry, and ASIC says, no, we are not going to give Parliament these documents, that is a, is, that's interfering in Parliament's ultimate authority to actually be able to find out what the hell is going on inside the executive government. So Parliament has the ultimate power. It is the ultimate accountable authority. And anyone who gets in the way of the Parliament doing the work that Parliament says that it has to do could be guilty of Section 4. Now, Section 7, Martin, is a really interesting section because it also talks about, that. well, if you are guilty, what are the penalties? So Section 1 basically says that the maximum jail sentence that Parliament can sentence someone for contempt is six months. And then in terms of the fine, it's only $5,000 for an individual or $25,000 for a corporation. Now, the one thing, Martin, is that 10 years ago, Senator Humphreys 
was looking at the, is, the, the issue of fines and thought that the fines were way too low. And he was interested to develop a private senator's bill to dramatically increase these fines, but uh, that piece of work, um, he never got around to it and there was never any amendment. So uh, if any senators are listening to this recording, there could be an opportunity to revisit the whole issue of these fines because these fines were set in 1987 and with inflation, these fines, they, they are way too low. So in terms of this whole show, sending ASIC officials to jail, it's not a it's not a give, it's not hyperbole, it's not exaggeration, it's not um, sensationalism. There is a legal framework of how if the Senate wants to put people in jail, it can. And it has, and it all goes back to not only the history of England, but it also goes back to this spe uh, specific piece of legislation, the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987. Now, here we, here's where we get into the most interesting part of the show, Martin, is, is that because people, most people have no idea that this happened, but, but in 120 years of Australian federal history, there was two people who have actually been sentenced to jail, and that happened in 1955. So if we go to the last slide, so there's a book called Mr. Big of Bankstown, and this is a famous case called Fitzpatrick and Brown, 1955, in which Fitzpatrick is a businessman who owns a newspaper in Bankstown, and Brown is the journalist, and both Fitzpatrick and Brown are found guilty by the Privileges Committee of the House of Representatives of contempt because they attempted to blackmail a Labor backbench MP. And during the course of the Privileges investigation, Fitzpatrick um, uh, confessed that their whole plot was to blackmail the MP. Now, when they when he admitted guilt there was effectively a trial in the House of Representatives. And what was the outcome? With Fitzpatrick, it was 55 votes to 11 to sentence him to three months jail. And with Brown, it was 55 votes to 12 to, for, in terms of him to go to jail. Now, Canberra didn't have a full-scale jail back then. So what happened was they were kept for about five or six weeks in the local Canberra police station. And then they were transferred to Goulburn Jail, where they served out in terms of their full sentence. Now, one of the key things to understand about this case study, Martin, is, is that even though it was a Labor MP, the government at the time, it was the Menzies government. So you have had the coalition uh, operating on a bipartisan basis with a, a good chunk of, of Labor and basically saying that we, you know, the parliament cannot tolerate a situation where a parliamentarian is actually blackmailed by people in the private sector. And they were, they were willing to use these powers to lock people up now uh, one of the interesting things martin that people should understand is so martin i've never actually uh, had to be in a courtroom so i've never actually had to go through court procedure but but if you are in a criminal court or a civil court there's a whole list of procedures that the prosecution or or, or the applicant in a civil case uh, uh, that they have to go through and you, you have the ability to have a lawyer you get to cross-examine you get to appeal. There's a whole raft of things that, that make up our uh, justice system, which is there to protect people from wrongful prosecution. Now, the really interesting thing with this, Martin, is, is that those rules don't apply in Parliament. Parliament sets its own rules. And what happened in 1955 was that Fitzpatrick and Brown were denied legal representation. So so basically what, what happened was they were dragged into, into the House of Representatives uh, and this is obviously old Parliament House. They were given the opportunity to make a statement to the chamber. Fitzpatrick uh, basically apologised for his conduct. Uh, Brown, the, who's the journalist, he was more defiant. He gave a long-winded speech about human rights and everything else. And he was actually you know, quite arrogant during this whole episode, which didn't go down well with the parliamentarians. But basically, now, I think Fitzpatrick asked for a lawyer. Um, and the House said, no, you're not, you, we won't allow you to have a lawyer. They weren't allowed to examine or cross-examine any of the evidence. They just were allowed to provide a statement, and that was it. And then, and then it went straight to a vote of the politicians. And then once they voted these people to jail, there's no appeal. What they attempted to do after they were sentenced to jail was they, they attempted to find a legal avenue to overturn Parliament's decision. So, so Fitzpatrick and Brown got a lawyer, uh, still to go to the High Court 
And lo and behold, the High Court ruled 7-0 to zero that Parliament's powers to put people in jail basically absolute, it's uniform, and there is no dispute. Parliament has the constitutional power to lock people up. And then even after the High Court delivered this judgment, uh, the same lawyers went to the Privy Council. So uh, before the, uh, the enactment of the Australia Act, people could appeal to the Privy Council in London uh, to overturn decisions in Australia. And they went to the Privy Council and, and basically made an application and said, well, we have this injustice of people being locked up by the House of Representatives. High Court has endorsed it. We want the Privy Council to overturn these decisions in Australia. And the Privy Council basically rejected the application and said that Parliament's powers in this uh, area are well defined for hundreds of years. And there is no basis in which to stop the Australian Parliament in terms of locking people up. Now, so, so I think it's quite interesting in, in the sense that we have a situation now, Martin, is, and if we can bring this show to a close, we have ASIC effectively guilty of two counts of contempt. We have a threat from Senator Bragg to refer ASIC to the Privileges Committee. Senator Bragg needs 39 votes and he has two pathways to get there. If a referral is made in the next few weeks and there is a Privileges uh, Committee investigation, we'll have to see what happens with that investigation. But if that investigation says that ASIC is guilty, Parliament has the power to put ASIC officials in jail. And who knows what the ultimate outcome could be. If ASIC doesn't come to its senses and actually realizes that just like how the private sector is accountable to ASIC when ASIC says you must comply with our notices and our orders, if ASIC doesn't treat parliament with the same level of respect, uh, you may have actually an unprecedented situation where now in, in, the, in the history of the Australian Senate, no one has actually sent to jail. It's only happened in the House of Representatives. But given that Senator Bragg said that any and all options are on the table, the ultimate option for Parliament and for the Senate is to lock up ASIC officials for for for, for basically not uh, not complying with Senate orders, for attempting to manipulate the Parliament, and and to in terms of manipulate Australian democracy. So we'll have to see where this ultimately goes but there's a lot you know, there's some people who think that this is just a run-of-the-mill inquiry and that nothing's really going to happen but i think something dramatic could happen and we already have threats of um that senator bragg is going to escalate the matter and that escalation could go in in a direction that potentially asic has not um foreshadowed well, i guess also um john on past performance um, if ASIC sees that there is a risk of a vote in the Senate on this, then I wonder whether they will Im uh, go down the path of uh, more informal briefings and lobbyings and all those sorts of below the waterline activities that uh, was exposed previously to try and actually deflect the Senate from being able to actually uh, get a vote and uh, basically progress this. So, you know, the stakes are quite high here. Probably have two situations, Martin. Is is that on the issue of the documents? If ASIC gets a sense that this is going to get out of control, what this, what ASIC could do is come to its senses and hand over the documents that so far it has been reluctant to hand over. But on a separate issue is that the events of what happened on the twenty seventh of October. Dare I say I don't think ASIC can reverse what happened on that morning. And so, and obviously we still don't know what specific communications occurred and, and, and who was the recipient of those communications from ASIC. So that's egg can't be unscrambled and that could still have a very dire situation, particularly if Senator Bragg is able to assemble 39 votes and actually get a referral to the Privileges Committee. So, um, so yes, so the moral of the story, Martin, is Parliament has enormous power it, it does have the nuclear option of putting people in jail. It has happened historically. These powers are well defined in English history, you know, Parliamentary Convention, but also the Parliamentary Privileges Act. And while it has not been used in in the Australian context for over 70 years, we may we may be getting into a situation where if senators are aggrieved too heavily, they may feel that the only way to bring in an agency that is uh, acting in a rogue fashion that is not performing consistent with Parliament's expectations, it could well be that the only way to get ASIC officials to understand the significance of this inquiry and, and, and the level of concern, universal concern across the Senate, it could well be that 
uh, jail time and a full trial in the Senate would be the only option to uh, ensure that ASIC finally understands what the Australian people want out of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Yeah, well, good point, John. And uh, once again, uh, tremendous uh, analysis on your part. And, uh, you know, if I come back to why we're doing this, this is about the interests of the people. This is to make sure that the um, financial system regulator is actually up to the task. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. We'll see you next time.